So today we have Patrick Pay Craig. He's the executive director for the Wild Animal Sanctuary. He's going to be talking about exotic animal transportation today. Please give a warm welcome to Patrick Craig. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, guys. Um, thank you for signing up for this one. Hopefully you'll enjoy it. <clears throat> Again, my name is Pat Craig, and I am the executive director of the Wild Animal Sanctuary. So this presentation, I kind of kind of fly through it because there's quite a few videos in here that I want to make sure that we're, we're good to go. <clears throat> so I don't know if we're good here or not. Get the first slide up. There we go. Okay, so you may or may not have heard of the Wild Animal Sanctuary. We've been around for 43 years. Again, I'm the executive director. Um, but basically, we, we've been rescuing large carnivores. Mostly, we do take in lots of other types of species, but large carnivores that were either abused or abandoned or confiscated. And in the early years, it was a lot of animals coming out of the zoo system, but then quickly it turned into where uh, a lot of those animals got into the private sector and then people started to try and keep them as pets. And so now, 43 years later, the, the organization has grown. We have more than 750 lions, tigers, bears, wolves, leopards, mountain lions. Um, we do have emus and ostriches and camels and other animals as well. Um, but we have um, the, now the largest carnivore sanctuary in the world with, with that many um, large carnivores there. We have four facilities. We have a 1,200 acre facility outside of Denver. That was our primary facility. We have a 10,000 acre refuge in Southern Colorado that we opened up about four years, five years ago. And then we have a 71 acre facility here in, in Boyd, Texas. And then a 22,000 acre horse sanctuary that we just opened up in Northwest Colorado. And so <clears throat> the Keenisburg Sanctuary is out on the plains of Colorado. So we've you know, obviously planted lots of trees. This used to be farmland. So farmers would always you know, plow under trees, whatever. Um, but this 1200 acre facility, and then we have a 10,000 acre facility in Southern Colorado that's forested as you can see. And so we build habitats down there that are range in size from anywhere from 10 acres to 300 acres at a time for any given species. And then the Texas facility is a nice, it's a small one, but we took this over. It was run by a different org organization for a number of years. And then the new horse facility that's 22,000 acres in Northwest Colorado, it's for Mustangs. So there are a number of states in the United States that still have wild horses. Colorado had four, facility or four herds that were managed by the BLM and they decided that they all needed to be called to a certain size and so all those horses went down to Canyon City which is a prison area and they were kept there for a couple of years and until they could find homes and and we worked with the governor to be able to, to open this facility and, and rescue quite a few of them. Currently there's over a hundred uh, Mustangs that live there. So the wild animal sanctuary again we specialize mostly in lions, tigers, bears, wolves, things like that but we do other species, like I mentioned. <clears throat> this will tell you a little bit about the facility, any organization. The Wild Animal Sanctuary is a nonprofit organization that is dedicated to educating people about the captive wildlife crisis throughout the world while providing a safe, large habitat for over 700 lions, tigers, bears, wolves, and many other species of carnivore. The vast majority of the animals we house were confiscated from illegal and abusive situations by law enforcement agencies. Many were rescued from private homes, circuses, and even zoos that were closed down. The ultimate goal with every rescued animal is to gently introduce them to living in a large open habitat with others of their kind. For many, their journey to freedom involves extensive medical treatment to nurse them back to health. Stepping out into their habitat is the first time they've ever felt grass or dirt underfoot. So we introduce them slowly through our innovative large habitat rehabilitation process that helps them adjust from small cage all the way to large open habitats. The Wild Animal Sanctuary provides an incredible new life for these rescued animals in our three facilities, two in Colorado and one in Texas. 
The main facility in Kingsburg is the only one open to the public and features a 1.5 mile long elevated walkway, which allows visitors to view the animals without disturbing them in any way. Big is the name of the game around these parts, and the sanctuary features over 10,000 acres of land available for habitats. That's over 15 square miles. Many of the individual animal habitats are larger than most zoos. For example, the world-renowned San Diego Zoo has over 100 acres of total land, whereas one single habitat at the refuge is over 250 acres in size. Put simply, the wild animal sanctuary exists to eliminate the captive wildlife crisis and to create a magnificent home to rescued animals where they can live out their lives in peace and freedom. Okay, so this is about transporting exotic animals. Um, so we'll talk about it. Obviously all those animals had to be transported to the sanctuaries that we have. Um, but a, a one thing that's important to know is that we rescue animals and we work with lots of government agencies from the USDA, the US Fish and Wildlife, the State Fish and Game, municipal law enforcement, and then even national welfare groups. Um, so again, 90% of the animals coming there aren't just you know, surrenders or something like that. They're, they're usually legal cases. <clears throat> and so we've gone beyond the United States. The problem that used to be just here is now everywhere. And so throughout the United States, and then it started to move into Mexico and Canada and and then just kept going from there. So we've been to a number of other countries to rescue animals. And so this is just a list of some of the ones, um, as you saw this slide before, about three facilities, we now have four. And so, so there's even a couple of countries that are missing from here. But high profile cases within the United States, everybody knows about Tiger King, of course. There was obviously some main characters in that show. Um, and so the four main ones, there's one more, uh, Mario Trebeau that you might've heard of, but either way, those four have been either shut down or um, are in the process of that in the sense that the first three were breeding 70 to 80 um, baby animals a year. So baby tigers, baby lions to hold and take pictures with. And so you can uh, understand that between those three alone, we were talking hundreds of these going out there, which three months later or four months later when they didn't want them anymore, they ended up going somewhere else. Usually that failed. And then we were called to come in and get them. Um, so the United States <clears throat> territories, we've been to Saipan and there was a zoo there that, that after they had a typhoon, Guam had a couple of magic shows that went under when COVID hit because nobody was traveling anymore. Um, so we had to go there and rescue lions from magic acts. And then Puerto Rico just recently this year, there was a zoo down there that was the only zoo on the island that closed back in 2017. They had hoped to reopen it and never did. So. They had trouble starting in 2012 where money was you know, being uh, embezzled and all sorts of problems. So the zoo kept getting less and less money to, to be able to run it. And eventually it got to the point where, you know, just the, the animal care and the food was really bad. So upwards of a thousand animals died from 2012 to 2023. And so the Department of Justice asked us to come in and take out the last 340 animals out of that zoo because it was never gonna reopen. Um, so foreign cases that we've done that are high profile, Ukraine, we went there obviously when the war started, rescued nine lions out of Odessa. Odessa was one of the cities that Putin swore he wasn't going to bomb because it was a port city. It was important, but he ended up bombing it. So the zoo there was having, you know, bombs go off and explosions. And so we took out nine Africans from there, uh, African lions. South Korea, we took out 22 bile bears when a group, a welfare group over there was trying to get the, the national government to endorsed the fact that they, they had made bile bear uh, reduct or you know, processes illegal, but yet there was no place for all those hundreds and hundreds of bile bears to go. And so this organization was working to try and get the government to create in-country sanctuaries for them. And us going over and rescuing the first 22 kind of brought a lot of media attention to it. And so they were able to negotiate a deal with the government to, to build sanctuaries there. We also rescued three African lions that were in a zoo that ended up killing the keeper by accident. He didn't close the gate properly. So they came back out on the exhibit when he was out there and obviously it ended up bad. And 
So they wanted those, the public wanted those lions killed because they had killed this gentleman. And, and so they were worried for their safety and asked us to come get them out of there. And then Bolivia back in 2000, I think 10 or 11, we rescued 25 lions. When Bolivia was the first country in the world to pass laws against circuses having animals perform. And so since then, there's been you know, hundreds of other countries that have passed laws as well, but they were the first country. So there, between them, they had eight circuses that refused to give up the, doing that. And so the government had to go in and confiscate all the lions. And so we ended up rescuing those and bringing them to, to um, our facility. And then Spain, <clears throat> we did 12 African lions and three grizzly bears from a drive through park that had gone under. The government took it over and, and tried to run it and still didn't work. So they closed it. And then those animals sat in small cages for a number of years before we were called to come get them. Um, so the United States Department of Justice and USDA both worked on the Tiger King case. Um, in 2017, we had actually started to go to Joe Exotic's facility to take out animals because he was going to close at that time. And so we were able to get um, 39 tigers and three black bears out of that facility before he changed his mind and decided to stay in business. And then obviously the, the show was filmed and, and aired. Uh, <clears throat> Jeff Lowe took over for Joe when he went to prison. And uh, we ended up rescuing 83 lions and tigers and hybrids from him when the government finally decided to go in and, and charge him with a lot of different trafficking issues. And Tim Stark, and he was another one of the characters. We took 16 lions, tigers, and hybrids from him. So all together, we took 141 animals just from the Tiger King, even though there were many other sanctuaries that helped as well. <clears throat> Make sure I didn't miss a video there. I don't think I did. There should have been one. I don't know if I needed to do something special to get it to play though. John, do you think you can see if that, no? Okay. All right, well, anyway, I can keep moving on. We'll see whether, whether you find it there. I don't know if it's just not queuing up. It might be after it. Is the blank slide before that or after it? Okay, sorry. Yes, this is the rescue of going into uh, mostly Jeff Lowe's facility. There were 42 US Marshals that went into that facility when we went there. Let's see if there's some sound coming up here in a minute. Yeah, it's working. We were there for two days straight, taking animals out, and and the second day it just decided to pour. First day was, you know, like it is here, you know, 100 degrees, tons of humidity, and then the second day it was pouring constantly, and and so there'll be audio here in a sec. But we operate these trucks and trailers um, primarily in the United States. We also bring our own equipment, forklifts, all sorts of things, as well as veterinarians and a mobile veterinary team that go with us. But in this case, you know, we were uh, taking out hundreds of animals over a two day process. It was about a six month process of going there numerous times for different cases they had baby tigers that had to be rescued and other smaller amounts of animals and then this was the final the eerie silence permeates this place where it all happened it's as if mother nature looks to hide the embarrassment of these horrible spaces seeking to reclaim this land for her own this this is mine she says Green tendrils of ivy spring up cage walls as if to pull them down. Doors hang open, rusted locks are cut. Branches and grass spring up to hide the scars in the earth, the painful devastation that occurred here not so long ago. These wounds caused by man's pride, man's hubris, soon shrouded by the tender fingers of new growth, of life overtaking pain. This was a place of captivity, built to make money, gain power, garner prestige, each animal trapped with a purpose to be bred, bought, sold, used to entertain. And today, 
the last animals escape forever, leaving this place empty, ready for nature to do her work. You'd think playing chicken with the U.S. government's Endangered Species Act wouldn't be a good idea. Citations pile up, inspections are failed, threats of imminent seizure are issued. The charge, failing to provide animals with adequate or timely veterinary care, appropriate nutrition and shelter that protects them from inclement weather and are of sufficient size to allow them to engage in normal behavior. Summed up, these precious animals were subjected to mistreatment, neglect, and abuse. And yet, these people, they, they fight back. Embroiling the courts in appeal after appeal, lawsuit after lawsuit, they raise up obstacle after obstacle, being as difficult as possible. And so, days go by as the animals languish in tiny, rotting cages. And still, it takes time, cutting through the red tape and weeks and months of due process just to get the job done. So when the U.S. government descended on Jeff Lowe's Tiger King Park on May 6th, along with the Wild Animal Sanctuary, only a few animals, those pregnant with cubs or most in need, were cleared to be taken. A rescue is always stressful, always taught with the tension of doing the job well, of ensuring the health and well-being of every animal that's rescued. Yet so many times, the sanctuary steps into an environment filled with intense danger. Threats of violence, taunts, and rage swirl around. You have to keep your head down, ignore the slurs, the yelling, and just get the job done. Yet the hardest thing to endure is when the day is done and you drive away with just a few of the animals. And you look in the rear view mirror and you see all those lives that had to be left behind still trapped in their cages, not knowing that someday their day of rescue would come. As rescues go, this is a big one. One of the largest and highest profile cases of animal abuse and neglect, amplified significantly by the exposure of Netflix's popular show, this massive rescue was a joint operation, incorporating 17 different sanctuaries from across the nation, each taking a few of the animals, yet leaving most for the wild animal sanctuary to rescue. Trust born from years of experience of working together meant that the U.S. government partnered with the wild animal sanctuary to manage the entire rescue from beginning to end. Each step was carefully planned in secrecy as equipment, trailers, and dozens of personnel were transported to the region. A convoy of trailers, equipment, and armed officers descended on the Tiger King Park. Trailer after trailer came and went. Cages were opened for the very last time as the animals were coaxed out into a world they weren't sure of, but would forever transform their life. For three days, the sanctuary loaded. Scorching heat mixed with sweltering humidity took its toll as sanctuary staff collapsed, exhausted, and were hospitalized. And yet the tremendous love and steely effort continued unabated through the heat, the mud, and the sweat. Each animal's precious life worth every effort, worth the time, worth the difficulty, worth the expense. Few smaller animals remained when the sanctuary drove away, their fate to be determined in the courts before they could be rescued. Yet the largest job was done. When the rescue was over, 68 lions and tigers were en route to a life far, far away. A beautiful peace fills the air of this forever home. Mother Nature's masterful handiwork, a true refuge. The perfect home to restore these creatures healing what was broken, stolen, or enslaved. This, this is mine, she says, as the cage opens and they step out free. They pause, they breathe deep, inhaling the sense of a world they never could have imagined, feeling grass, brush, life underfoot as they step carefully forward for the very first time. 
these tender, magnificent giants who'd been confined in cages no bigger than a car. They lose no time in exploring the far reaches of their freedom, enticed by an openness they've never yet known. They roll in the deep grass. They take shelter under trees, play, eat, and just be. The stress, the trauma of their captivity flows away in this tremendous place of peace, this refuge, now and forever their home. This, this is mine, says nature, as she does her work. All right, so um, that was some of the refuges. You saw a lot of the equipment we used the aspect ratio on that video was wider. So you know, squished, you could see everything looked tall and skinny. Even the tigers looked tall and skinny. It was kind of funny, but, but anyway, um, when in Saipan and Guam, we had to go over there, like I told you with the typhoon that they had in 2018, there was a small little zoo on Saipan that was decimated and there was just the two big cats left there. And in Guam, there was a resort and it had uh, uh, two magic shows there. We went back again for another magic show got six tigers but you can see that you know the island was definitely leveled when when its typhoon came through and um, we were able to pull out all these animals and take them um, they had kept the lion on top of the rooftop of the hotel up there where all the hot air conditioning units and everything were but we got all those guys out and we flew um, internationally to get them back to the united states and then the south korea one that i mentioned um, before with the bile bears that were used for that and this will show you a lot of the, the, what was involved with that one. From the outside, it doesn't look like anything important or spectacular. Nestled in wooded foothills far removed from the city, this rural farm hides the dark secret of a history of abuse and trauma fueled by the demand of traditional medicines popular in many Asian cultures. Thousands of years of traditional medicines taught that the bile from bears was an important and necessary ingredient in many elixirs, potions, and treatments. In the early 1980s, harvesting bile from live bears became an important industry in many Asian countries, often subsidized by their governments. The process was barbaric. Bears locked into tiny rusted cages unable even to turn around, draining bile from their gallbladder 24 hours a day, their life dripping away, drop by drop, hour after hour. And so the farmers bred more and more bears, their bodies merely a cog in a barbaric factory designed for just one thing, to make a ton of money for as long as they could until they died trapping them forever in the most horrible conditions imaginable, encircled by hellish rebar, concrete, steel bars, surrounded by dirt and filth, given just enough food to keep them alive, serving a growing demand for this bile. And so for decades, this most secret industry built on the suffering of hundreds of bears continued unabated. Most people in Korea were unaware of the trauma happening right outside their doors.
Yet as time went on, animal rights activists sounded the alarm, and soon public opinion began to sway the legislators in Korea. New laws shifted the focus to the bear bile farms, and soon the breeding and importation of the new bears was outlawed. Yet the existing animals continued to suffer. Finally, in 2020, the South Korean government announced a full ban on bear bile farming, a huge success. Yet still, there were hundreds of bears trapped in horrible captivity. Many farmers now, without a reason to keep the bears alive, stopped feeding them, harvesting and selling their organs wherever possible. And so the race was on. To rescue and relocate hundreds of suffering animals before they were euthanized. To save the bears, the Korean Animal Welfare Association, or KAWA, immediately reached out to a long-trusted partner from far overseas, the Wild Animal Sanctuary. Years before, the two organizations partnered together to relocate three lions who needed rescuing from the Seoul Zoo following a fatal accident where one of the lions took the life of one of their keepers. Many in the Korean community called for the lions to be euthanized, Yet Kawa looked for another option. Our organization uh, thought that this was also not a fair uh, outcome for the lions. We contacted the wildlife animal sanctuary and they immediately understood the situation of the lions. As it is with any international rescue, tremendous amounts of paperwork, negotiation and coordination was required. Within months, however, the wild animal sanctuary overcame the obstacles, and soon the lions were headed to the sanctuary. When they arrived, the leaders of Kawa, who traveled with them, were overjoyed at the tremendous peace and wilderness available for these big cats. I thought it was magnificent. The kind-heartedness that I could feel when I was at the sanctuary was enormous. It was the best day of my life. And so, years later, Kawa naturally contacted the sanctuary sharing with them the impending disaster of the Korean bile farm bears. The sanctuary agreed to help, yet the scope of the need was incredible. Rescuing three lions is one thing, saving hundreds of bears was a completely different matter. The decision was made to have the wild animal sanctuary rescue a small group of bears so as to raise awareness of the bear's plight and bring the subject of the animal's forefront to Korean legislators, in turn, raising enough support and community well-being to build in-country sanctuaries in Korea for the remaining bears. And so, on March 14th, 22 bears were tranquilized, given needed medical treatment, and loaded into transport cages, beginning their long journey to the wild animal sanctuary's refuge. These newcomers to the refuge were initially placed in small lockout cages, designed to transition them slowly from the small bear bile farm cages they were used to, to the massive open habitats of the refuge. There they rested for several weeks as the little bears acclimated to their new home. And then came that one day when their cage doors were open for the very last time and they stepped out onto bare earth for the first time in their life. At first, most of the bears stayed close to the safety of their lockouts, exploring carefully. Some not used to the immense space circled and circled, spinning round and round on the same portion of earth as if they were still inside a small cage, not realizing that for the first time in their life, they could walk in a straight line. As time went on, the bears disappeared over the horizon, deeper and deeper into the trees, canyons, and caves of the refuge. Within months, the bears had completely acclimated to their new home, only emerging from their hiding places to eat and drink, reveling in the quiet and peace of this place. 
Nature has taken her normal healing course, slowly undoing the damages done to these bears. Now they keep mostly to themselves. Every once in a while, you can see the blink of eyes from beneath a tree or a cute little bear bottom as it walks over the hill out of sight into the wilderness. So um, then in Puerto Rico this year, we were, uh, in that case, you saw the transport crates that we use, both IATA crates. We have um, well over 100 IATA crates that are made to, to ship all over the world to get these animals. The trucks and trailers that you saw all have air conditioning and heaters in them if they need them. They have video uh, monitors in them. So while we're driving, we can monitor the animals. Um, and then uh, we have obviously uh, different vehicles and different equipment that goes um, internationally that sometimes we even send our own equipment internationally as well. <clears throat> but our main concern is making sure that the animals are transported you know, very comfortably. So when Puerto Rico came up, again, it was a zoo that had been closed for a long time. Um, our big concern now was we were gonna be shipping you know, hundreds of animals internationally rather than just a, a dozen at a time. And so we were talking a lot of different kinds of species, everything from an, they had, the zoo had an African elephant, um, two hippos, a rhinoceros, it had camels, zebras, um, and primates. Uh, there was lots of a, a wide variety of animals, lots of different birds. There was bald eagles and golden eagles and, and uh, Andean condors there and all sorts of things. So we spent quite a few months finding homes for all these animals. Um, <clears throat> and so it was called the Juan A. Rivero Zoo. is the only zoo on the island. And in um, 2012 is when they started having trouble. And 2017 is when it closed. And then there was the hurricane that hit. Um, but FEMA had promised them $6.2 million to fix the zoo. But again, the government started to argue over the money. They never spent it on the zoo. Nothing ever happened. Nobody could agree on anything. So obviously in 2023, the Department of Justice said, that's it, we're coming in. We're going to start charging everybody, prosecuting and all that. And of course, everybody finally agreed to just give up and, and give the animals away and avoid prosecution. So this should be another video here. I think it is. No, nope. sorry about that. There's two places that the surprise was there was a zoo that had 300 and some animals there, but they also had a, a what was called a, a detention center, which was the government's wildlife place. So um, wild animals that people had got like baby alligators and caiman and then they released them or there was a lot of wild macaques, um, not wild, they were domesticated, but they were they escaped from a lab. And so there's hundreds of macaques that run loose on the island and those would show up in people's houses and um, some animals were hit by cars and stuff. So we went in there in, two, in March to, to look at the zoo and then assess it and then to go back and start rescuing all the animals there. And so you'll see a number of different kinds of, of um, equipment in here from the crates that we got that was cooperative from, you know, Disney gave us um, hippo crates and, and rhino crates and after Hurricane Irma barreled through Fuente. Irma unleashed up to 185 mile per hour winds, the eye passing just north of Puerto Rico. <laughs>
So this is, uh, I apologize for the um, marketing that goes in these. These, a lot of these videos obviously we use, but I just wanted to be able to demonstrate the, the equipment that's being used in all these rescues. So this is the zoo. Um, this one doesn't have any sound to it, but this was a zoo and you saw that there were, you know, giant cranes involved in lifting this elephant who weighed, a cr that crate alone weighed 19,000 pounds empty. And then you put an elephant in it and then obviously the hippos into these crates and Again, Disney loaned us um, the crates. The White Oak was involved and sent a team of experts down for the rhino and the hippos. And then there was a team that came for the elephant that was elephant veterinarians and, and uh, the team that transported the elephant on the airline. And we had a dedicated flight for just the elephant and the two uh, hippos and the rhino. And then the uh, camel went to our facility in Colorado. And so that's the uh, airline crate that they give us to transport it in. But we also had quite a few Barbary sheep and, and uh, mouflons and, and white-tailed deer and a lot of other animals in there as well. Uh, <clears throat> but the biggest problem was the elephant. Um, many people on the island remember the zoo very fondly back when it was open and grew up going to it and they didn't want it to, to close or, or not go uh, reopen. So they fought very hard to keep that elephant there because they felt like that was the most iconic animal. If it left, then the zoo would never be resurrected. So we had the last week before she moved, we had been training her to go into this uh, elephant crate for over a week and she was doing great. We'd go in, stand there, eat. And two days before we moved, uh, the move came. One of the people that had been, there was lots of people sneaking into the zoo and trying to harass her with noise and other things. They shot her with a BB gun while she was in the crate to try and get her to be afraid of the crate. She flew out and of course at that point thought the crate had bit her or hurt her. And so we spent two drastic days trying to regain her trust to get back into this crate. Um, and so the night of, or the day of the move, we finally by about 5 p.m. had to just give her a nice light sedative so that she would just calm down, kind of like a, a valium for elephants, I guess. And so at that point she walked right into the crate. It just took the edge off of her being afraid of of getting whatever hurt her to begin with. Um, she went to a sanctuary in Georgia, an elephant sanctuary there, and then the hippos and the, and the rhino came here to Texas um, to a wildlife preserve that's down in the state. And so they're there, she's in Georgia doing wonderful now, lives in this uh, amazing sanctuary down there and it's uh, just under a thousand acres and she had, uh, they have two other elephants there. They have um, Asian elephants there that she's actually now friends and they all three hang out together and, and go around. Um, the hippos were in this tiny little pool there. And so it was a matter of conditioning them to come out of the pool for food and obviously get them used to the crates. We had uh, the crates lined up there to where they walked through the crates to get to the food. And then obviously when the day that they were exiting the feed area, we could just close the door on the crates and take them. But still, even then it took obviously large um, cranes to move them around as well as the, the tractor trailers that you saw but even the elephant had, uh, and the rhino and the hippos had air conditioning when they got to into the United States. So they landed in Jacksonville, Florida, and then the semi trucks and trailers that moved them had air conditioning units that would pump into those um, crates for them. And so that was what we did with those guys to make sure that they stayed comfortable the entire time. Um, but the flight alone, it took a special jet that could accommodate that elephant's crate because it's so tall. Um, you know, you're talking a lot of expense for moving all these animals. It was about a $2 million rescue 
to move all these animals out of the zoo and get them to um, their future homes. So they did have emus and large birds, uh, ostriches, emus, um, and then of course a lot of smaller birds like parrots and, and um, macaws, all sorts of different ones. But we use um, a lot of crates that we constructed there on the island for them that met the IADA standards um, so that these weren't the metal crates that we typically use that are more durable. These were one-off uses. So they were um, plywood in nature, you know, had the, the barriers to keep them from getting too close together. So they the proper ventilation, all the things that are important for making sure these you know, animals stayed healthy during that. Um, a lot of the catching was uh, difficult just because, you know, the humidity and the, and the rain that constantly fell there, everything was just pure mud and trying to deal with getting the animals loaded. But thankfully the um, FedEx loaned us the crates that we needed to, to be able to move all the larger hoof stock. And so this is when they're heading to the airport at that point. They did have primates, they had different kinds of monkeys. They had these lemurs that lived in this little concrete building on an island. When the, after the hurricane and the zoo never reopened, the water had gone, level had gone down. So lots of primates and things were escaping the lemurs because the water level was so low they could run across the log or something to, to escape. So they just decided to lock them up into that concrete building for six years, they were just stuck in there. Um, <clears throat> so then we did have, you know, the tiny little animals. We had hedgehogs, we had uh, gerbil, we had, <laughs> we even had a goldfish and uh, tegu and um, a lot of them, but these were the turtles and the reptiles that came from the detention center. So there was like 50 some odd caiman. Um, I think there was 30 or 40 sulcata tortoises. There were 50 some odd um, other various turtles. Um, there was another 20 uh, uh, aquatic turtles that were there. There were different size caiman. So these crates were um, special crates that could you know, hold water for the caiman to keep them cool. This was a lungfish that we had to rescue as well. Um, and those went to, I think he went to the National Aquarium and tons of snakes. They had these, con these wood boxes where they would just bring all the snakes that were found on the island and throw them in these plywood boxes. And, and so there would be 110, 120 snakes all in one box on top of each other. And so obviously the snakes on the bottom suffocated and died. And, and that's how they kind of just had constant euthanization going that way versus humane euthanization. But so we took out, um, in one load alone, there was 296 animals that went on a flight to Texas. It landed in Dallas here, um, and it went out to various sanctuaries, you know, everything from Black Beauty to, we have our own sanctuary in Boyd to a number of other ones. And then we, the rhino um, came again here to Texas, as did the two hippos. Um, but again, we had specialists there from White Oak that dealt with the rhino and, and specialists for the hippos and, and all the animals. We took the African lions that were there. We took the black bears that were there. Um, so our sanctuary has those currently, but most of the animals were special and needed to go to primate sanctuaries or, or other sanctuaries that were dedicated. So the airlines, um, we work with them quite a bit on these international shipments. And so um, that's one of those things that you're always constantly working on to try and make sure the animals can arrive and get on the plane in a very short amount of time rather than they typically with cargo want it to be there for six hours ahead of the flight. And just so it's simple to move it. And that's obviously not good for the animals. And so there's quite a bit of uh, finagling to make sure that we can show up and get the animals right onto the flight and that the flight has the temperature control in it as well. Um, so all told, this is the list of animals it may not be, it might be small and hopefully you can read them, <clears throat> but there was a um, total over 700 animals that between the detention center and the zoo that we took out of there. And then we went to the Ukraine, as I mentioned earlier, there were nine lions. It's deadly assault throughout Ukraine. A new look at some of the destruction. The focus on the strategic port city of Odessa. Changed beyond recognition. Attacks on civilian targets are increasing. Casualties, both military and civilian, are growing. Two million refugees have escaped Ukraine. They are reaching the breaking point. The air raid sirens. The air raid sirens. The air raid sirens. The air raid sirens. Every rescue is a little different. 
Each presents unique challenges, unique obstacles that must be overcome. Each animal's experience is so very different. There is no such thing as a normal rescue. Yet, for some reason, this rescue seems like so much more. The rescued animals sense that something big is going on. They sense the energy, the nervousness, and are completely aware of the intense drama taking place. They're often on edge and fearful, their adrenaline pumping. They don't know what is happening to them. They don't know what's beyond that cage door. They don't know what incredible life awaits them. And so every effort is made to keep them as calm as possible, to gently transition them to their new home. When the animals are rescued, it often creates a tremendous stir in the local community. It becomes an event with local politicians, news media, and lots of onlookers, all curious about the extraordinary journey of these animals. Rescue days are long days, where time and tremendous care is of the essence. Each moment charged with hard work and patience each animal's healthy transition of the utmost importance. And so the day wears long as hours pass, as each animal is carefully loaded into the truck. And finally, darkness falls as the truck begins its long journey across the country to the waiting plane.
The mission to rescue the kings of the jungle from the horrors of war. These lions are being cared for at the same animal refuge as cats from that whole Tiger King saga. At close to 10,000 acres, staff say this is the largest carnivore sanctuary in the world. Why so much attention? Is it really possible that these nine lions have the power to inspire an entire planet? That they're symbolic of so much more? This, this long journey to come here, to this place, to step out in this moment and to carry with them the hopes and dreams of an entire nation in turmoil, of an entire planet that knows that we can do better, that we must be better. Each of us horrified by the tragic violence, by the images of loss, of waste, of anger, violence, and greed. These lions, these majestic creatures truly capture the hopes of an entire nation undergoing tremendous strife, yet a nation that is strong enough to endure the hard times. It seems this journey is not just these lions' journey. It's representative of all of our path. Their story provides a mirror with which we can truly view ourselves, a reflection of the worst that man can do, yet combined with the best and brightest we can accomplish when we set our hands to something greater, Rewriting the wrongs, restoring what is broken, knitting together a world back to the way it should be. And so, one by one, each lion steps out into a life they never knew existed, carrying with them the hope of a better world, a safer world, a world of peace. Okay, in the interest of, uh, I'm glad it worked out good timing. We're trying to catch up from a late start, but it, you know, if you have questions, I know we don't have much time at all about transportation or any of the barriers we ran into. Like they had to go to Romania because we had to get them out of the bombing, but the US Fish and Wildlife hadn't issued the import, the emergency import. So we took them to Romania and luckily had a place to place them until that permit was fin finished and we could bring them into the States. Um, but otherwise, that's the end of my presentation. Hopefully, just through osmosis of seeing a lot of the equipment we use and the, and the caging. And as you saw that last one, those cages were built, built in Romania and to our specifications when we got there, unfortunately, there was all sorts of problems with them. We spent days you know, grinding and trying to come, you know, fix all the rough spots, everything else you could do to other than short of rebuilding them completely, which we didn't have time for. 
So again, those are the kind of things you run into in these uh, international rescues and, and problems that you have to just resolve on the spot. But other than that. So as Pat stated, we did get a little bit late start. So we gave him an extra five minutes in speaking and we're gonna at least take two um, questions. So if we could get one in person and one virtual, does anyone have any questions for Pat that's transport related? And if not, that's fine. But thank you guys for the, the Karen, chance to present. Thank I you very much. I have a couple here. Craig, we do have one right. virtually. What's that? We have one virtually that okay. Karen's going to read off right. for us. Yeah, it's great. So in doing rescue transports, is the first time you are seeing these animals when you're trying to get them into your transport enclosures. Can you talk about the process of transporting or transferring these animals from their cages to the trucks? Uh, so the first time seeing the animals, I'm trying to make sure I heard the whole question and then transporting them from the cages to the trucks. Did I get that right? Maybe I didn't quite hear it exactly right. But anyway, um, we try to almost always go ahead of time, which that's a luxury that's not very there very often. We try to get as much intel as possible, um, especially on international rescues. It's hard to fly there and you know spend time and come back, but we do that on, on occasion and probably for about 40 or 50% of the rescues. Um, but then, you know, transporting those animals um, from their position to the trucks or from the trucks to the, the temporary lockouts, things like that, you know, we have to take into consideration, obviously, the sound of the equipment. That was a big concern in the Tiger King rescues because it was much tighter space, as well as any of these other rescues. So we typically make sure that we pretest, you know, to see what they, how they react to sounds. And if we have to use electric ones, we do have electric transport vehicles and electric forklifts if we have to, that are quiet. Um, most of the animals um, usually react pretty well to those transport equipment and don't really panic about the sounds unless they're really up close and tight. Um, but did I miss anything on that question? I wasn't sure. Anyway. Right. Karen, oh. did you have any more if we don't have I any do. in person? What are some of the most common issues or challenges you've encountered with transporting of rescue animals? Um, what kind of issues? There's always tons. So yesterday's presentation on an emergency uh, preparedness and, and having you know, alternate solutions is a huge part of rescues. You know, no, no matter what you go in, there's always something that didn't work out. Um, and so having plan B and plan C and making sure that, that you have something so if equipment breaks down, we usually um, have follow chase vehicles that can help with repairs. And we also carry all of our own equipment. You may not have noticed on those rescue vehicles that we not only have the generators for the air conditioning, but we also have a welding equipment on there for any times that we have problems with either a, a crate or a cage or anything else. But we constantly are looking to be able to solve those problems on the fly, because especially when you're in another country where you don't know the resources, we try to look ahead of time to meet companies that can solve problems for us if we do run into a problem. Um, so there is quite a bit of uh, work ahead of time on most all rescues to cover those bases. The states that you're gonna be transporting through, looking for um, other facilities that could be an emergency stop place in case something re for a big reason with the equipment broke down for a longer period of time, um, lots of things like that. And so there's a, a great amount of work that goes into making sure that there's backup for everything. Awesome. If okay. everyone could thank Pat for being here.